I worked as a personal trainer. I took a year off from teaching to work for a well-known fitness franchise. Let us refer to them as fitness foremost because they have more expertise as managers than floor crew. This included training new personal trainers, assisting them with their businesses, collecting rent, and organizing membership activities to get members involved with the club, with the expectation that members who were actively engaged with the club would keep their memberships for longer. Everything was fine for the first six months. The district manager who hired me was a lovely guy who was far too smart for his position. No one realized I was a teacher with a background in business development, and we got along really well. However, he went to return to his original love and design, and was replaced by what could only be described as a car salesman of a manager. Sorry to any auto salespeople out there. Constantly present in his office, glued to his phone even when no one else is there, harassing the female PTs, sporting that effing sharp teeth smile, and consistently attempting to establish himself in positions of power and influence. Is there a press release about a new gem opening? You best believe his space was present. A personal trainer wins an award. I had two directly employed floor personnel who were responsible for keeping the gym clean, reporting any damaged machines, and conducting inductions, among other things. DM laid them off without informing me, and when I returned from vacation, there was no one working at the gym. To save money, he terminated the cleaning business contract again, this time without my knowledge. Other gyms under his sway continued to have cleaning professionals come in at the end of the day to ensure everything was spotless. I questioned why ours had been cut. I was told that because we were in the suburbs, we were off in a road lined with shops and near a big tram station. We didn't need them. So I inquired who would handle the cleaning. Guess who? So from a position of power, where I oversaw a small team and advised PTs on best practices, I was now basically responsible for cleaning the gym full-time. The local council had approached me. I leaped at the opportunity to work for them in a variety of schools and prisons, having become disillusioned with the fitness sector. I submitted my three-month notice with the goal of working out the remainder of the summer vacation to earn some money rather than sitting at home all day playing PlayStation and abusing myself. Meanwhile, because I'm too busy keeping a complete gym clean, I can't help them expand their empires. Therefore, they're struggling. I also didn't have time to organize any more membership engagement events, which I had paid for out of pocket for various reasons and will never do again for any organization. Additionally, I am unable to work 15 hour days without a day off and the only employee present is a receptionist who does not wish to vacate the area by 9 o'clock a.m., which I do not understand. All is well and good, but after a month and a half, DM brings in his London-based equivalent. The London dude was three times as smarmy and obnoxious as DM. I'm hauled into my office, which has been converted into a storage room, and Joseph yells with the door open about the awful state of the gym. I had no idea what he was talking about. Anthony was clean. He then makes me walk around and drags his finger over the tops of certain machines to show me where there is dust. It could only have been more wonderful if he had worn a white glove. The rest of the gym members observed as he moved from machine to machine, checking for any sign of dust. He practically jumped to the top of a cable frame to demonstrate how dirty it was. Unless one of our eight-foot members stooped down to kiss the tops of the machine frames, it wasn't a concern. I stated that I couldn't clean every square centimeter of the machinery without any additional personnel. Back at the office, Joseph was the source of my negative attitude. The fact that I had stopped organizing membership and engagement activities and that I should go home and reflect on my future. I understood then that they both had no idea and had forgotten that I had submitted my notice. Oh, happy day. I stifled a smile and was asked what I found so hilarious. Here's the thing. The amount you give is proportionate to how long you plan to stay with a company. I was devastated because I only had around five weeks until I started a much better, higher paying job. I solemnly pledged that I would consider ways to improve my work performance and future with the organization. They went, having successfully corrected my apology. I waited almost 12 minutes after they exited the building. 
I grabbed a red permanent marker and scrawled I quit on one of the three posters preserved in my old workplace. I grabbed my coat, hugged the receptionist, and drove home. I was told that the DM had to roll up his costly sleeves and scrub, which was excellent. Let's get to the good stuff. Here's what happens if you cancel your membership at a fitness center in the Northwest under DM's rule. You must give your notice in writing. Of all the people who quit, one third had funds deducted from their accounts. From that third, almost one third would continue to not check their bank accounts. However, the other two thirds would protest and receive a refund and so on. People who left the gym a year ago were still paying their membership fees. Fitness Foremost also had a forum called Fitness Foremost, which was created by its irritated members, as well as a Facebook group, both of which were operated by ex-members who had first-hand knowledge about the practice of ignoring one-third of cancellations. Check your bank statements, everyone. Local newspapers take notice and begin asking questions. Extend your arms wide. DM's boss intervenes and promptly removes him. Gym memberships have dropped so low that the gym has been sold to a competitor. The knock-on effect is that they lose all of their Northwest sites. As far as I know, they only exist south of Broome. I'd like to blame myself for the failure of their Northern franchise, but I believe it was more due to poor management and a lack of concern for the client. I also see him being chained to a bike with no seat and forced to cycle across the United Kingdom. But now, well, since I was about 10 or 11 years old, my father has had me working summers for his landscaping company. I have to admit, my father did a lot for me and I treasure the memories of working with all those grown-ups and having them involve me. Plus, I had more money than the other students at school, which was enjoyable. My father was a rough man, though less so now. But to be clear, she is fair and has a golden heart. I grew up learning to rake dirt, palm trees, and most crucially for this story, operate equipment. After graduating from high school, I began working full-time for my father as an equipment operator. However, we were relatively seasonable. He managed an equipment rental company that mostly served a single pipeline company but also had a few other clients. The first three years of this cycle, landscape in the summer and pipeline in the winter, went extremely well for me. That could have been a condescending urinate, but I was getting paid and hardly noticed the individual, so it was irrelevant. It was difficult being away from home so much, and I know it took its toll on my wife, Mary Jung. But that's another story. But we were saving for our first home, so I was content to be in my condition. La shows up on site one day, as predicted given the location's proximity to headquarters. He invited the group out for drinks after work, which was unusual. I'm the only man working for him. Here is where things get weird. He spends the entire time trash talking me and telling stories about how I was an affluent child, and he gave me a job as a favor, how I never worked hard, and so on. I attempted to shrug it off, but I was actually mortified. On the way back to the hotel, he comes to a halt, and his cheerful attitude flips a switch and says these things that I will never forget. Maybe you should go work for your dad and leave the genuine men alone. Get out. It was only a 10 minute walk to the hotel. So what the heck happened? It turns out that my father in LA had a disagreement about something I won't get into here, but I was irritated to say the least. It was only a month until we started landscaping and I had some money, but it was a minor setback. What disturbed me was how it went down. I did not deserve that. Being involved in a minor dispute, it bothered me and I couldn't let it go. But then I got an idea. Why can't my father's company do the same task that Delay does? Those pieces of equipment lay idle for three to four months each year. This is a no-brainer. I worried over that idea all summer with each bucket of dirt I moved. To be honest, my father wasn't very happy about it, but I'm his kid and he supported me. It was still up to me to sell it. The first possible client I addressed was Gavin's Bread and Butter. Because I had worked there for three years, some significant personnel recognized me and offered me a modest contract. I subcontracted an excavator and grinded to them for the winter, 
and I was out there driving the excavator while also handling all administrative chores. I was a trencher and my hours were even worse. The next year we became the primary subcontractor for said company and began working with several other clients. I didn't have to operate machinery anymore. We've also broadened my father's love of landscaping into some pretty huge projects that were previously impossible to complete without the new iron. I only saw LA in the workplace once, years ago. Pleasantries were exchanged, but I felt entirely vindicated when he witnessed a 28-year-old youth take up his cranky old market share. And while JVN is still doing his thing, he has lost his biggest client to us. At this point, it is irrelevant. It is history. That being said, God's debugger was the original inspiration for me to take over what my father had constructed and carry on the torch. Our company is still expanding, but is a family business, and I would like to keep it that way. Get deported. First, this is about my brother-in-law from a few years ago. He had lately taken a position as store manager for a large chain tire business. They chose to give him a business that was in a nice location but had awful sales and was approximately an hour away from where he and my sister lived. He didn't care. He was simply delighted to be offered the opportunity to be a store manager. Now, my brother-in-law is basically Jonathan from Seinfeld. He will never mislead a customer or sell them anything they do not need. It is actually part of the tire store's objective. They prefer repeat customers to lying and screwing people over. However, one major limitation is that you cannot use the shop for personal purposes. You can now bring in your own automobile or that of a friend or family member and receive a significant discount during working hours. It's so obvious that you'd be foolish to ignore it. So my brother-in-law is all about obeying the rules, making his store go from unprofitable to a great example. He explains this to each of his new subordinates. They all agree and have no difficulties with this. So things are going well at the store, but he sees that his inventory is a little off. An oil filter here, an air filter there, nothing major, but still easy to trace, so it shouldn't be missed. One day after beginning his lengthy journey home, he finds he has forgotten something and returns. When he comes to the shop, the lights in the auto base are turned on. He then observes one of his employees, Isaac, working on a car on a hoist. This is well outside of working hours, so he asks, What thief is going on? Isaac freaks out and swears it's an emergency. My brother-in-law is relatively forgiving, but with all of the tiny missing goods, he suspects something is amiss. So he lets Isaac keep his job, but warns him not to mess up again. Now, my brother-in-law could have forced him right there. But he had no proof that this was more than a one-time incident and he wanted Isaac to be blacklisted. Because lying to him is one thing, stealing irritates him greatly. So everything is okay for about a month, and then components start to go missing again. He ended up hiding out for approximately an hour, far enough away from the shop so that his automobile could not be spotted. I waited then returned to the shop to see Isaac working on automobiles. Apparently, the shop was doing poorly because Isaac was underselling it. Then they pocket the money. So my brother-in-law fired him right there. What made it better was Isaac's green card, which required him to work in order to stay in the nation. My brother-in-law, also an immigrant, made the appropriate call and had Isaac deported. Isaac was arrested while attempting to re-enter the United States, according to what he has heard. The shop finally became so successful financially that they relocated my brother-in-law to a separate struggling store closer to his home and just promoted him to a higher level manager position. I have no idea if he was on a green card or a work visa.